Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, Houseplanty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today is going to be another continuation of the plant review series, and I've got arguably what is probably classed as a bit of a common houseplant, at this stage anyway. It wasn't a few years back, it was a plant that a lot of people were trying to find, and there was some controversy around it. So let's dive into today's plant, which is the Raphidophora tetrasperma. And before we go into the review of this plant, let's set some ground rules. So for the people joining us again, as always, welcome back. It's nice to have you as always. Have a look down below. You know that on the progress bar, you can find your favorite section. If you want to jump to that, please feel free to do so. And for the newbies joining for the first time, welcome to the slight insanity that is this plant review series. Now, the ground rules are, this is a personal review for my plant, with my care, in my conditions. By default, it means that I cannot be unbiased. It is my biased opinion of this plant and how I found growing it. Now, I do encourage you all, if you've got this plant, and a lot of you might already have this plant, to leave your review down below, how you found growing it, how long you've been growing it for, what your conditions are essentially. And what I'm hoping is that this plant review series will become a bit of a repository of information. When people are looking to get a plant or they've just got a plant and they wanna see the realities of what it's like, because as I keep mentioning, there are a lot of videos out there of people first getting plants. Maybe there's an update somewhere in the future that might happen, but I've had some of my plants for a good few years now, this being one of the plants that I've had, and I think it's still in shot. It is right here, it's on a table. So I will pick it up and be holding and showing it to you as well as inserting some clips. But yes, enough prattling on from me. Let's dive into the first topic. Oh, and this is exciting because I can have it on the table when you can still see the plant. Again, obviously I'll insert clips throughout the actual review so you can see it in a bit more close up. I will lift it up one more time so you can see it. And it is in a self-watering pot. It's in Lechuza Pond, or more specifically, Soil Ninja's semi -hydro mix course. And that's only recently been moved to, but I will talk a bit more about that in Accessories and Care. And you can see how it is up until the very tippy top. I'll bring it in a bit closer as well so you might be able to see, but as I said, I'll probably be inserting some clips as well. Right, now, what I will do is also insert some clips here, hopefully, of what the mother plant looks like, because this is one of many propagates. So the mother plant has moved with me three different locations, and it is currently behind me that you might be able to see it peeking through. I'll have a look at editing and I'll see if I can see it peeking through. I might actually just kind of point it out to you. It is attached to the wall and whatever that might mean. And I'll come through to that in the accessories and care section. But let's rewind all the way back and I'll show you a picture of what the mother plant looked like when I first got it. So that's from my plant care app. And this was, a plant that, as I mentioned in the very, very beginning, might not be an uncommon or rare plant to find these days. Back when I was trying to get this plant, it wasn't as easily accessible. I still managed to get my hands on it and I didn't pay an awful lot of money. The controversy, and I'm not gonna bore you on here, there are plenty of videos about the controversy. Mm. Uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but let's go with controversy about this plant was that kind of battle between people who thought, and I say thought because I don't know if there was any significant way of being able to prove it one way or another, thought that they had plants originated from a cutting of a Raphidophora tetrasperma and plants that came through tissue culture of the Raphidophora tetrasperma. And it was one that caused a lot of chat backwards and forwards. I didn't really dive into it too much. I don't know 100% whether or not I've got a tissue culture or I've got a plant that originated from a cutting that rooted out and all of these things. 
I don't know that I even went through the effort back then to look at what people were claiming was signs of tissue culture or signs of all these things. Mm. My kind of thoughts on this is, do I like this plant? Yes. When I got it, obviously. Do I like this plant? Yes. Does it grow easily? Yes. What difference is it really going to make to me whether or not it's tissue culture or if it originated from a cutting? A lot of the plants that we have start off as tissue culture plants. A lot of plants that we have now that are from cuttings or more common plants that have been propagated from cuttings, somewhere further back in its genealogy, it might have been in tissue culture at some point. So <laughs> I didn't get involved in that too much. The plant was fine, whether or not it was tissue culture or not didn't make much of a difference for me. It might have done back then in terms of cost, because this did get relatively pricey at some point, but we'll talk about that at availability. It's not anymore, spoiler. <laughs> but, and I think that probably would have made a bit of sense in that respect, because if there was high prices, I think a lot of people wouldn't want to be paying tissue culture prices. However, I will remind people that the Monstera Thai Constellation, which I've got on the corner there, is a tissue culture plant. And it started off as a tissue culture plant, and it's still demanding high prices. Granted, I know that's a supply and demand issue, but what I'm trying to kind of highlight here is that sometimes tissue culture will be a bit more expensive. Tissue culture takes process. Anybody from my followers, and I think maybe a few of you do, or have attempted to do tissue culture, it is still on my things to do, might do it this summer, maybe because I can play mad scientist. Do let us know down below if you find the process of tissue culturing or kind of the learning curve that everybody has to do in order to do tissue culture worth some of the prices. Because I think a lot of people will poo poo on tissue culture and say, eh, it shouldn't cost that much. I'm just like, yeah, but even from some videos that I've seen, I'm just, it's a bit of an involved process. It's, I think the only thing that tissue culture might do is slightly better success rates, but it's an involved process one way or another. And there are things that could go wrong the same way that propagating from a cutting and rooting it out could be. Oh, I didn't expect this section to go on about tissue culture. I am terribly sorry. But that's how this plant came to me. I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is, this is a plant that I think I've had for over four or five years. The title will have that, the mother plant anyway, not the propagate. And I'm trying to remember where I got it. <laughs> trying to go back in my memory. I think this was actually from a plant store. And I think I was fortunate enough to get it from a plant store when not that many people, I'm trying to give you a bit of a timeline here, when not that many people were aware of it yet before it became difficult to find and before it got really expensive and before the slump afterwards. So I got it and it was, again, we'll talk a bit more on availability in terms of pricing, but I did find it and get it. And it has grown in multiple locations and it's done well. I mean, this is one of multiple propagates, as I said, but I think that's probably enough on some of the background on this plant. Obviously, I can't close this section off without saying Raphidophora tetrasperma again, because this is the quintessential plant of, if you really want a tongue twister of a Latin name, or a botanical name more specifically, this would be the one. <laughs> but yeah, let's, let's move on to the next topic. Now, speed of growth with this plant. This is an interesting one because it goes through different stages, I find. So if you are propagating, and I'll touch more on the propagation, I feel I'll, I'll leave that entire speed of how things work in propagation on the propagation section, which is coming up after this. But generally speaking, if you've got a plant that's after the propagation stage and it's rooted and it's growing relatively fast, relatively fast. So I would almost kind of relate this in terms of speed of growth, and I always benchmark this against the golden pothos, almost to the same level as a golden pothos in terms of speed of growth, as long as the plant is happy. But yeah, and I think the interesting thing is there is the thing that I found over the years of growing this, and I will see if I can drop this down so you can see this kind of stubby little growing tip at the top there. And this has happened with this propagate. It's happened with a propagate upstairs. It's happening 
with the plant that's on the wall there. There is, I find, and again, it might be because I haven't really ever grown this specific plant on a moss bowl or a plank, but I have grown it on a wall and it has attached to the wall. So it should be kind of giving me the conditions of what it would look like if it was growing on a tree. Now, the interesting thing with this is you do get a little stubby thing at the top and there is a point where I find it really starts crawling in terms of its speed of growth. And I find that it's different for different plants. So kind of for most of my plants, I found that it will quite happily get to maybe a meter, meter and a half. And then it starts struggling a bit, basically, in terms of that one singular vine. It, it will then start kind of really slowing down. So for instance, these leaves at the very top here have been there, haven't changed, that growing tip hasn't moved for about four months, I would say. Granted, it's not getting a huge amount of light, this one where I have it now, and it's moved um, substrate a couple of times now, so that could also be causing it. But I have seen this time and time again with my Raphidophora tetrasperma. Again, I don't know if it's just mine, because obviously all the experiences I've had with multiple Raphidophora tetraspermas have been from the genetic material of cuttings that I've got from my mother plant. So if the mother plant's genetics have got some kind of hiccup somewhere along the lines that might be blocking that, that would make sense that all of its progeny, all of the propagates from it, because essentially they are clones of the mother plant, would potentially have the same issue. So I would be really interested to know from people that have potentially got this plant and have been growing it for a while, is yours absolutely huge? As in like two, three meters tall and still uncontrollable and still growing like mad. The other thing I will say about this plant is, and I was trying to find pictures online and mm, correct me if you have found ones that I missed. I was trying to see if there's a mature form of this plant. And the only pictures that I could really find, even in its natural habitat, is maybe the leaves are slightly larger than they are now. I mean, obviously these are some of the smaller leaves. Uh, probably the largest leaves I've ever seen, leaves I've ever seen, is probably the size of my palm. I, I don't think I've ever seen pictures of this having big leaves like uh, a Monstera deliciosa or even an Adansonia when it grows big. This, to me, I think stays relatively small. And if I am thinking of the Raphidophora cryptantha, and possibly the next review that I'm gonna be doing will be on that one and my views on that, and I've got two, it would make sense because the only experiences I've had with the Raphidophora genus, I think, I'm pretty sure that the Raphidophora is a genus in itself, I'm not, mm, I will correct myself up the top if it isn't, have been that they have slightly smaller leaves. So one, two, kind of bear in mind, but I think I've prattled on enough about the speed of growth. Let's move on to the next topic. So ease of propagation with this one, and this is where it gets a bit interesting. And I have done a few other videos on kind of my experiences growing this plant, and I'll link them at the top there. But this is an interesting one because what I have found happened with this plant, and it was a bit of trial and error, and is because I saw a few other people's videos and some information online when I was struggling. I've grown this in water propagation. I've grown this in perlite. Perlite was a bit slower. I think for me, the best way to propagate this plant actually probably would have been water propagation. And I think, I don't know if I've done damp sphagnum moss. Maybe I've done damp sphagnum moss, but the interesting thing with this, and I think that's why the water works so well with this plant, is that in terms of growing it as fast as you possibly can from a propagate, it will root relatively easily and you'll get some decent aerial roots. And I'm inserting some videos here, hopefully, of the aerial roots. But it starts its life, at least what I found works well for it, it starts its life when it's rooted as a crawler. So very similar to the Philodendron gloriosum, where it needs to, the, the growing stem needs to be on the top of the soil level for it to be happy. 
I'm also really curious with this one. I think all the pictures that I'm finding online in nature, it's attached to tree trunks. I don't know if this is one that we can grow up things and maybe that's why it stops growing after some point and it will do that okay, but it prefers to be a crawler generally. Because as I said, most of the time it starts off as a crawler and then you can kind of start to get it climbing and binding and all of these things, and then that's fine. So that would be an interesting one. If you know, do let us all know down below. But yeah, so that's the little hiccup that I would say in terms of speed. And it can be, for me, it was one of my slowest plants to propagate. In my experience, yours might be different, tell us. But I found water propagation was the fastest and most reliable for me. Then I would get it on top of a soil or whatever growing media it would be, and it would take its time to kind of establish there, and then it would start pushing out the leaves. And from the point where it starts pushing out its maybe second or third leaf since it's been propagated, it takes off. And then in terms of speed of growth, it applies what I was talking about in the previous section, and it starts getting about as fast as the golden pothos. But yeah, a bit of an interesting one, because for me, this out of all of the plants that I own in terms of propagation, this one has some idiosyncrasies, like what I was just mentioning now. But yeah, thought you might find that relatively interesting. Let's move on to the next topic. Availability, obviously, <laughs> I touched on this very briefly at the very beginning of the video, but for me, in my experience, as I said, I found it in plant store. It wasn't particularly expensive when I got it. I think it was mid to low double digits. It wasn't hugely expensive, and it was a relatively bushy plant at the bottom. There was multiple growing stems in it. I'm trying to see now. Potentially they're still there, but eh. Um, it wasn't particularly expensive. It did then get really expensive when people were trying to find it. And again, that tissue culture versus cutting thing came into play. And I think that inflated prices one way or another, because if somebody could claim that it wasn't a tissue culture, they would charge more. And it all became a bit ridiculous, basically, at some point. But it obviously has fallen down in price. I would go as far as say this at the moment, at least in my location, I would possibly assume even Europe for this one is almost a common house plant. Now, it, it's kind of almost there, at least from what I am seeing. I think I've seen this in supermarkets recently, and I've definitely seen this in the big box stores over here. Uh, for all my American followers, we generally don't call them big box stores over here. I don't think anyway. It's kind of uh, hardware stores or DIY stores. In there. <laughs> but yeah, it's one of those things that is kind of almost become just readily available. So the prices are really low. I, I would say you can get a decent sized plant of this on kind of under double digits or just into the double digits. It's not massively expensive. My thoughts on that is great. I truly think that this plant is almost as easy to grow as a pothos. And I will touch a bit more on that on the accessories and care, and I'll give my full views in the very end when I give my final thoughts. But yeah, so it's had a bit of a journey in terms of pricing. I am not going to touch on the variegated form of this plant for right now. And yeah, I will kind of say that the price dropping makes it a lot more approachable for everybody. And I think that's a good thing. But yeah, let's move on to the next section. So pests with this one, it's an interesting one. The pests that I found do occasionally like to go on this is thrips. And I'm trying to see if this is thrip damage here. I don't think it, mm, no, I don't think, I think that's mechanical damage on that leaf. The, other one that I have seen on occasion is spider mites, but again, nothing huge. Mealybugs, yes, but again, nothing huge. I'm also pretty sure that this is the one plant that I have seen in multiple people's collections, including mine, that could be infested with pests, and it's still doing its thing. Obviously, you do need to treat it at some point. But at least in my experience, it can be very forgiving when it comes to pests. The probably one of my first examples of my feral plants that, that you'll see the mother plant. <laughs> oh, it looks so shabby. I don't know whether I'm going to 
gift it or chunk it up and like give proper gifts to friends who don't have it or whether or not I'm just going to start again with that one. I don't know. But um, yeah, I think those would be the big ones. But nothing's unmanageable, I found, in my experience with this plant. So uh, an all round, I'd never go as far as say pest tolerant plant, but it's, it's kind of leaning towards it. It can, it, in my experience at least, it won't decimate a plant. Again, in my experience, with relatively mature plants, obviously. I'm not talking about baby plants. That could be a different topic altogether. But yeah, pests, okay with this plant. Coming into care and accessories. Now, I did mention this. This is in semi-hydromix or Lechuza Pond. I had it in the smaller Lechuza Pond or the kind of Lechuza Pond, which is a slightly smaller level of substrate. And I've got it now in the coarse mix. I think it's happier in the coarse mix. Unfortunately, when I was trying to repot this, uh, I was doing really well and there was a lot of roots and it would kind of all network down. I'm just like, great, let's try to keep them all. And I just kind of like snap one thin root, which I realized then was half of the branching roots were coming off. <laughs> you know, I'm laughing. And we all know that we've done that at some point or other where you're just like, oh, it's fine. I've just snapped a little roof up. It'll be fine. And you're just like, that's half the root system gone. But it's bouncing back. And it's a testament to this plant's tenacity, I find. Because in my experience, this plant can tolerate a decent level of overwatering, possibly even some root rot. It can, it can tolerate a decent level of underwatering. I mean, before you kind of go past the point of no return and the plant will die, at least in my experience, because there's points where this plant has sat in stagnant water and I'm pretty sure half of the roots were, were root rotted. It was fine. It lost a leaf, <laughs> two leaves maybe. Um, same thing when it was overly dry, they start kind of curling up on themselves and all these things and you water it and it's fine. It can be very forgiving, which for me, and I'll touch, I keep trying to go into my final thoughts, but I'll leave that until the end. Uh, in terms of substrates and things like that, I've grown it in a uh, light, airy, arrowed soil mix, done well. I've grown it in just pure perlite, that did well. I didn't, the propagating into it and then growing into it was fine. Sphagnum moss, I think it's grew fine in. I would imagine this one, if you gave it not even necessarily an arrowed mix and just did a soil mix of just whatever kind of indoor plant soil, which I haven't used for years, but amend it half and half with perlite. It'll be fine. It's not fussy. At least it hasn't been in my experience. So in that respect, <laughs> oh, oh and, I, and I will show you the janky support sticks. For the win, there are two and it's still, can you see how much it's like wobbling? <laughs> But uh, the other one isn't looking much better. That one has attached to the wall. Yes, you could probably grow, grow this up a plank. Yes, you could probably grow this on a moss pole. Yes, it will still do okay on support sticks. And I think that's the important bit that I wanted to talk about here when I was talking about leaf size. I don't know whether or not, again, based on what I have seen and what I've experienced, and I am sure you will correct me down below if you've got differing opinions or if you've seen this with your own eyes. I don't think a moss pole will make it get much, much bigger leaves, much, much faster, basically. I don't think the plank, or even when it's attaching to the wall, will make that much of a difference to just the regular support sticks. I do think that if you do let this trail, and I think I've seen some of this trail down like a proper trailing plant, that the leaves can get smaller like you would get with some of the, one of some of the other kind of trailing plants. But other than that, it's not particularly fussy. It's done okay in most, soil, media, kind of types of substrate types. Net pots, yes. Terracotta, yes. Plastic, yes. It's not a fussy plant. At least it hasn't been in my experience. But yeah, overall, like a, it's relatively straightforward care. I would almost say it's on par to a golden potter. So if you can keep a golden potter alive, you can probably keep this alive. You can probably keep this alive. Mm, and people might come to me for this one. You can probably keep this alive 
even if you can't keep a golden pothos alive, possibly. But yeah, let's let's dive into that final thought section, which I keep trying to dive into, and let's kind of start wrapping this up. So my final thoughts on this, and this is a bit that I can kind of dwell into a bit more on what I was going to say. If I, knowing what I know now, and I didn't have this plant, would I get this plant on that very specific technicality? Yes, 100%. On the technicality of I've got too many plants and I can easily replace this now without too much fuss and I know how easily it can grow, probably not. I just don't have the space for it anymore. Does it stop the fact that I still think this plant is kind of awesome and everybody should have owned one of these plants at some point in their life? No, I think everybody should own one of these plants at some point in their lives. I've also, sorry, I should have mentioned this in the background section, but this also will wrongly be classed or named in shops as a Monstera Minima. This is not a Monstera. I kind of get what they're trying to do there. It kind of looks a bit like with the with the splits in the leaves that it could be a small version of a Monstera Deliciosa, but at the same time, you can get most Epipremnums to, to kind of get the splits that Monsteras will get as well. So, and actually, do I think some of the Philodendrons as well? Possibly. Yeah, I think some of the Philodendrons can get splits similar to the Monstera leaves. So, yeah, um, don't know why. Should they really have the proper name? Yes, but again, with a name like Raphidophora Tetrasperma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense, and I'll see if I can kind of find the. Obviously, the Raphidophora is the the genus, and the species is a Tetrasperma tetra or deseris or tesera is four in Greek and. The sperma aspect of it might be angiosperms or something like that. It might have four angiosperms. I don't know. I'll kind of find at the top and see if I can find the name for the tetrasperma element of it. Because it's it's ringing very ancient Greeky and very kind of possibly a descriptor of a scientific thing that happens with this specific plant. But I'll see if I can find it. If I can't, I might, I might just be blind, basically. But yeah. So... The story as well behind this that I will give is, and I know this is more anecdotal and it's one experience that I've had, and, no, maybe two actually. I have given propagated cuttings of this plant to two friends, which by their own admission, really not into houseplants, really cannot keep houseplants alive. And to be fair, they're not important enough for them and most plants for one reason or another will die in their care. This plant, is still alive three years later in their care and they forget to water it and they overwater it and it's not in the best condition and the cats might scratch at it and the kids might have knocked it down. It's still going. That's why we're saying it's almost for me more quintessential than a pothos. Because I mean, the pothos has been around for years and we've all used to it. Maybe some of us are a bit bored of the golden pothos. This is something new for people to get excited about. And truthfully, at least in my experience, it's been super easy and I can benchmark that against my friends that are not that great with plants if they're keeping it alive. But yeah, with the final score, like 0, 1 being the worst, 10 being the best, I probably won't give this a 10 personally because it doesn't excite me. Um, it's not a plant that I'm just like, oh, I'm so happy to see it when I come in here in the morning. I've had it for years. Maybe when I first got it, it was kind of cool. I would still give this a solid mm, six or a seven, I'd say. And it's more personal. If it was in terms of for other people, I would probably give this a good like nine or a 10 score because it's, again, I will say this again, it's simple. It's not difficult to take care of. It will grow quite happily, mm, it's fine. But yeah, let me know what your thoughts are on this specific plant. Uh, I know a lot of people have kind of said they, they kind of are appreciating some of the slightly more common houseplant review videos, which is probably a good thing because I'm running out of some of my rarer, more un uncommon plants. I have got some, I just haven't got them for long enough that I would be comfortable doing a review and saying this has been my experience for it for a year or two years. So they will be coming in the future, but 
we might be delving into some more of the common or slightly harder common plants to find. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.